Welcome back, NCCP. I'm Pastor Melissa, and I invite you to join with me in prayer. Holy and gracious God, open our ears and our minds and our hearts to the word you have for each and every one of us this day. And as I, your servant, stand before you, I pray that I would decrease, that you would increase. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, this weekend is one of my favorite holiday celebrations. If you think I'm going to say Valentine's Day, you'd be wrong, because The reason I most like to celebrate February 14th is it commemorates the birthday of one of my heroes in the faith and in ministry. So happy Anna Howard Shaw Day. (laughs) Anna Howard Shaw was one of the first women who was ordained to preach in the Methodist church. She was also a physician, one of the first women to be admitted into Boston University School of Medicine. She broke barriers all the time. But one of my very favorite stories about Anna Howard Shaw was that she had a day where she was supposed to be going north to a lumberjack camp. And in order to do that, and this is the late 1800s, she needed to travel alone And a stagecoach driver was giving her a hard time. She knew she needed to be there to preach the services the next morning, and he was refusing to take her because she didn't have a man to accompany her. So what did Anna Howard Shaw do? She reached into her pocketbook and pulled out her pistol. And she sat in the stagecoach all night long, holding the pistol to the driver so that he would take her where she needed to be because she knew that God needed her to speak the word at that camp. Now, I'm not saying we should go out and hold pistols to people's heads. No, no, no. Don't get me wrong here. But I think it's a really important lesson for how it is we deal with obstacles that get in the way of the goals that we have. Because for a lot of us, We would take that refusal of the stagecoach driver to take us where we needed to be, and we'd say, oh, I guess I'm not going to make it. We might try to come up with another way to get where we're going, but what we have to do is take what we have, where we are, all that's at our disposal, and be creative about the next action. We see a glimpse of that when we come to the scripture reading from this morning. Because Israel, again, we talk about how they're in exile and they've had so many trials and they're hearing murmurings that another leader from another country is rising to power and they're thinking this is a a time once again when they're going to be crushed underfoot. And God's trying to bring them this word of hope and encouragement in the midst of that time. And when we go and look at the word that God brings, he's reminding the people that they are his chosen that they are special to him. He says, I, I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners you. You are my servant. I chose you and I didn't reject you. Don't fear because I am with you. Don't be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will surely help you. I will hold you with my righteous strong hand. All who rage against you will be shamed and disgraced. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will look for your opponents and won't find them. Those who fight you will be of no account and will die. God is reminding the people of the strength that they have available to them, that the Lord is the one who is strong. But this is the place where we need to pause and take a look at how this scripture goes on. Because while God is making all of these claims about the power that God brings to this situation of difficulty, we have to go on to verse 13. 
I am the Lord your God who grasps your strong hand, who says to you, don't fear, I will help you. First, God talks about God's strong hand. But then there's also that piece of it that includes our strong hand. It's what we bring to the, to the equation as well. It's not only God at work, but we as God's people have to be responsive and recognize the strength and the power that we also have that we bring to God. It's an important part of who we are, especially as Wesleyans. We understand that we have free will. So when obstacles are put in, our posi- in, in front of us, we have to stop and say, what's my next move going to be? The same is true for all the resolutions we may have failed at thus far. Where have we been the cause of that? And what do we need to do to take ownership of what's supposed to come next? I like in this, in this chapter of Isaiah, if we go on to verse 14, it says, Don't fear, worm of Jacob, people of Israel. And you think, worm? Why would God call the people a worm? Well, Eugene Peterson talks about how it's actually in Hebrew a term of endearment. And that's something important for us to see, that we might be small and fragile in, in, the, in the course of all of human time and space and history, yet God still empowers us and loves us and invites us to be part of what God is doing, to not be afraid for what comes next. When Jesus is teaching, there's a particular story that we have had in the background these last two weeks that you might not have picked up on. And that's the story of blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. It's in Mark 10. And we've actually been saying the words of Bartimaeus during our call to worship. But Bartimaeus has been blind his entire life. And he's calling out because as all the people are getting so excited that Jesus is in the area, they know that he has been a healer. They know that he has touched people and changed their lives. And so Bartimaeus is calling out to Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of man, have mercy on me. What I love about this story is that all the people around Bartimaeus are telling him to be quiet. Just stay there. They know that he's been blind his whole life. They don't want him to bother Jesus. All of them have things they want to bring to Jesus, and and they think that this man is just in the way. And instead of stopping and just being fine with his lot in life, What does Bartimaeus do? He starts shouting even louder, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. And everybody that's scolding him is still telling him to be quiet. But Jesus actually stops. And he asks this beautiful question. He he says, call him forward. And so the people start to say to Bartimaeus, okay, Jesus is calling you. They say, be encouraged, get up, he's calling you. Some translations even put it this way, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And Jesus asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man says, teacher, I want to see. Jesus says, go Your faith has healed you. And all at once, Bartimaeus is able to see. So let's look at the videotape. Let's rewind. Let's take a look at the instant replay of where we have been in these last few weeks. Where can you take ownership of those challenges? But more importantly, as you look toward what God is calling you to do, What is it that you need Jesus to do for you to help you get there? 
to recognize that God's strong hand is there so that we don't have to be afraid, but also that we bring a strong hand to the equation. What specifically is it you need Jesus to do in your life? If we make a resolution that we want to get healthy, what is it we need Jesus to help us do? Is it that we need the strength to get the help from a medical provider that we've been putting off? Is it that we need to go and clear out our fridge and our cupboards and actually fill it with healthy and good things? Is it that we need to find someone to be accountable to, to go on a walk with us a couple of times a week? Or is it that we need to pray more fervently before God and to set a timer to know that at a particular time and place every day, we're going to meet the Lord? But when we bring all of that before God, we have this question, what is it we need God to do for us? On Wednesday, we're going to enter into the season of Lent. And as you've been reflecting over this past week and now into this week, you may have a better grasp of who you're trying to become in the sight of God. So over these next few days, this is the time to solidify those plans for what you're going to take on spiritually for Lent, what you're going to do to help change the distance between you and your Lord and Savior. And in the midst of all of that, to ask Jesus directly, for the things you need Jesus to do to help you in all of these areas where you're striving to be more and more perfect and in God's image. On Ash Wednesday, we will invite you into the observance of Lenten disciplines. That's not the time to start thinking about what they might be. No, that's what we want you to do here and now in this space today, tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, and then on Wednesday when we put the sign of the cross and ashes upon our heads and we remember that from dust we came to dust we shall return. That in our human fragility, the worms that we are, small and vulnerable, yet beloved by God, Where do we need our Lord to give us strength to take on the discipleship journey that God is calling each and every one of us to? That's our task. And I invite you into this journey for the next six weeks. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Melissa of the North Carroll Cooperative Parish, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. And we've enjoyed being able to provide our content to you anywhere. So we hope that in this season, if you have been blessed in any way by this ministry, by our sermons, by other things that we've been able to bring to you online, that you'll consider making a special donation to NCCP Anywhere. That helps us to do things like upgrade our internet speed, buy new equipment, and other things that we need to upkeep this this portion of our ministry. We also always encourage giving to any of our locations, but this is a special opportunity if you want to support our online presence to give to NCCP Anywhere. Again, we thank you for being part of our worldwide family, uh, that we can be connected through these platforms even when we can't be together in person. This is the next best thing, and you're still part of our church community. Community. We're glad that you're here. So thank you for your support and God bless you in your faith journey. Amen.